Hi, my name's Andrew Francis, and today we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 61. I'll begin by reading verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Isaiah now reintroduces us to the servant of the Lord. The servant is speaking in the first person, telling us that he has been especially anointed by God and filled with the Holy Spirit. As we know, the words Christ and Messiah literally mean anointed one. In the Old Testament, whenever there's reference to the Spirit of the Lord resting on someone, it normally means that God has given that person supernatural wisdom and ability to act. The Pharaoh recognizes this in Joseph, and Bezalel has been filled with the Spirit in order to craft things for the tabernacle. It's also interesting to note that the servant is anointed for a task. The task, according to verse 1, is so he can be sent to bring good news to the poor. The rest of the verses, 1 to 3, describe who these poor are. In this passage, the poor isn't simply speaking of those who are financially poor, but anyone who is distressed and in trouble for any reason. In other words, the message of good news is a message that will only speak to those who recognise their desperation, their poverty or their need for whatever reason. Like the story of the tax collector in the temple who lamented his failure before God compared to the Pharisee who was only aware of how good he was. It was the tax collector whose needs were met, whose prayer was answered. As we see in the ministry of Jesus, the servant's message is also accompanied by action. He will bring good news to the poor and he will also bind up the brokenhearted. He will proclaim liberty to the captives and also open prison doors to those who are bound. As God's chosen servant, and the one through whom God will bring about his salvation, he can also declare the year of God's favour. Our sins have been paid for, the wrath of God has been averted, and we now live with assurance that God smiles upon us as his beloved children. In the previous chapter, bronze becomes gold and iron becomes silver. Now, in this chapter, ashes become a beautiful headdress. Mourning becomes the oil of gladness, and a faint spirit becomes a garment of praise. Just as everything in God's city will be transformed into something beautiful, so too everything in God's people will also be changed. I remember one day when Grandpa Bob and I went to the gay bar in the city to hold our Bible study. We bumped into a man there that we knew. He was a very rich man who had made his money through gambling on horse races. He'd shown little interest in the gospel message. On this day, however, he was very upset because his mother, who he loved very dearly, had just passed away. His heart was heavy with grief and sorrow. I asked him if he would mind if we prayed for him. He agreed, and so Bob and I prayed for this man, and as we prayed, his whole countenance changed. He explained that somehow the weight of his grief had been removed, and now he felt light in his heart. He rang up his sister to tell her what had happened to him. God had done a miracle in this broken man's heart. Like Zacchaeus, he was a sinful man who was in no ways deserving of God's mercy. But for whatever reason, God saw him and through two of his servants showed his love for him. This surely was a sign pointing to the kingdom that God has inaugurated through God's holy servant, Jesus. When we think about what it might mean to be oaks of righteousness, it's also worthwhile to consider what Isaiah had to say in chapter 1 concerning oaks. In chapter 1, verse 29 to 31, it says, For they shall be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers, and like a garden without water. It's evident that the oaks and gardens spoken of here are references to places of idolatry. And the people are described like an oak, but one whose leaves wither. Now, because of the sovereign work of God, these people... These people's lives, spoken of in Isaiah 61, will have been so transformed that they will become strong and secure, living lives exhibiting God's righteous character and bringing glory to God. When people seek to glorify themselves, it ends up in limp leaves. When people accept God's will through his servant, 
they become all that God intends and he is glorified. Let's read verses 4 to 7. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. Just as the poor and the imprisoned will be set free, and just as the morning will be filled with praise and thanksgiving, so too will the ruined cities and places also be transformed. As God's people are changed, as they are transformed, everything they touch is also changed and transformed. This is why the whole of creation groans to the revelation of the sons of God. As you and I are transformed from one degree of glory to the next by looking into the face of our Messiah, so too are people and places by coming into contact with us. As I used to often explain to people, wherever we go as God's children, so too does God's Spirit go as well. Whether I go into a gay bar or my wife into a brothel, the light and holiness of the Spirit of God also goes with us, bringing light and holiness into places where sin and darkness seem to abound. In 1 John 4 verse 4, it says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 5, 4 to 5, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is a victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And as we go as ministers of light, as priests joining in the intercession of Jesus for all people, we discover strangers and foreigners ministering to us and seeking to meet our needs. Sometimes in the bar, I would have gay men and women offering to buy me drinks or give me money for my ministry because they could see the light of Christ in me. We can think of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, ministering to the needs of Paul and Silas after God opened the prison doors for them. One who had previously been their tormentor and captor now becomes their willing servant. These stories are signs of the inbreaking kingdom. They point to the greater reality that we as believers look forward to. As we become witnesses for him and fulfill the call of God's people given through Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When we go as God's witnesses in God's power, then we will experience blessings beyond imagination. But these blessings are not simply for our sakes and for an increase in our prosperity. They are to be passed on that others also might be blessed. Our boast will be in their glory, in their blessing. This is the heart of a father. A true father does not desire so much that they themselves might be blessed, but rather that their children will be blessed. The church desperately needs more people with the heart of our father. And so we read in Matthew 10, verse 29 to 31, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. It's important to also be aware of Jesus' words in Matthew 10, as in this age there is still an enormous cost to be paid, both up front in terms of what we have to leave behind, and also in terms of the sobering reward of persecutions. But as Jesus also makes clear, the difficulties will only continue in this present age. There's an age to come. And as Isaiah points to, the time will come when all shame will be removed and replaced with a double portion or the inheritance of an elder son. Dishonor will be turned into rejoicing over all that we have been given, and everlasting joy will be ours as we discover that our inheritance is twice what we might have lost. Again, I think of saints throughout the ages who have lost spouses and children because of their decision to share the gospel in difficult places, even their own lives. 
The grief and pain experienced by some of these saints is hard to imagine. And yet the rewards are guaranteed to more than make up for the suffering and loss that these people went through. I'm reminded of the tragic story of Job, which ends in quite an Isianic way. In chapter 42, verse 10, we read, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And so we read our final few verses from 8 to 11. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. In verse 8, God reasserts his love for justice and his hatred of robbery. But in this context, it would seem that he's not making such statements to have a go at his people as we've seen in previous passages. Rather, it would seem that he is letting them know that he can never be accused of robbery and wrong in the way that he rewards his people. Rather, as he fulfills his covenant with them, the surrounding nations will be so impressed by what they see taking place amongst God's people that they will declare that these people are indeed blessed by the Lord. A story we heard recently regarding our friend Neil, a visiting American preacher, was at the time when he worked as a foreman in a logging factory. His boss was ordered before the company directors and told that he would be sacked if he couldn't find out why certain crews always had 10% greater outputs than others. The boss struggled to understand what it was that caused the differences because there didn't seem to be any common cause that he could find. The workers in the teams were often different and so it couldn't be that. Eventually he worked out that whenever Neil was a foreman, the output was greater. The boss was a believer and knew that Neil also was a believer. He discerned that this greater output was because of the hand of God on Neil's life and work. He fronted Neil with what he had found and explained that he had to sack Neil, otherwise he would lose his job. Whilst the eventual outcome in this story is not what we might want, nonetheless it's a story about God's evident blessing on his people that could be witnessed by others. I'm sure that many others have similar stories that you could also share. In the final two verses, yet again, we see a shift in who is speaking. Now it's not the servant or the prophet or God. The people are rejoicing as God's bride. They have been clothed with garments of salvation. They couldn't save themselves. This had to be God's doing. Now, because God has saved them, God has empowered them with his spirit, they can wear robes of righteousness. Now they can live and act in God's ways, giving true representation and witness to others of whose bride they are, and therefore also of the groom to who they are being wedded to. We can hear the fulfilment of this in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 8. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Everything is now ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. At last the bride can be outfitted in a manner fitting for her groom, and at last the groom prepares himself in a glorious outfit for his marriage to his bride. The promises of God are being fulfilled in the most incredible ways possible. Finally, we get to verse 11 and we read that just as surely as the earth will bring forth plants that have been sown, so too can God be trusted to cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. These promises pointed to by Isaiah can be trusted implicitly. These words will surely find fulfillment as the book of Revelation also testifies. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged in the word of God. God has a plan for our lives beyond anything that we can imagine. And even if we have to go through great difficulties in this age, even if in our lives we go through times of great testing and hardship, we know that there is a reward beyond imagination 
that God has for his children. God bless you.